Glory to the Lord. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, Creator of the universe, Father, we come before you tonight and we are thankful, Lord, that this church has been called out of darkness and into light. Uh, each member of this church is part of your kingdom. Father, we thank you for that. We pray, God, that you will just help us to be uh, open and available to be used by you in your service to do the things that you've called us to do. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the uh, opportunities that we've had this year to serve you and to share the gospel and to be about that. We also are thankful, Lord, that coming up in a couple of weeks, we'll be able to have a baptism. Uh, and Father, there will be several baptized. We look forward to that. We also thank you, Lord, that we uh, participated in the Lord's Supper this week. What a beautiful opportunity to worship you and celebrate you this past Sunday. And Father, we look forward to being here again on Sunday. And Father, we thank you for each and every person that's a member of this church and their families. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for your love and watch care over us. We thank you for your support and your spiritual growth uh, that you give us through your Holy Spirit in us as we walk with you. And we pray, God, that you will help us to be faithful to you, that you will help us to recognize the sin that is in our life, that you will help us to repent and confess of that sin to you. And Father, seek to eradicate that sin from our lives as we seek to move forward in your will and way. And Father, thank you so much for tonight. We pray, God, that you'll be with our Bible study. May everything we say and do bring glory and honor to your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And I just before we begin tonight, I just want to say to you that I, I know you've, you've read through the Bible multiple times in your life. You've studied the Bible and been to various classes. You've, you know what's in the Bible. And it doesn't take us long of ever beginning to read the Bible where we find out that, that God's Word is brutally honest about the, the history of redemption. God's Word tells us exactly how things went. And while we understand that God is always faithful and God is always righteous, and God always acts in ways that are good. We note that his followers don't always act in those ways. That, that the great successes of the Bible are told next to stories of great faults in the Bible. Great blemishes of the characters in the Bible. Um, think of all the great characters in the Bible. Moses, greatest prophet before Jesus. And yet he didn't get to enter the promised land because he disobeyed God and really dishonored God with his actions. Up until this point in the book of Acts, the churches looked pretty good. Everybody's been doing what they were supposed to. Everybody was generous with one another. Everybody was charitable. Uh, everybody was willing to do whatever is necessary to accomplish the will of the Lord. But then we begin to see now that there are some issues that pop up from time to time. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect church. Did you know that? You know, if you go to a perfect church, when you join it, it becomes imperfect. I can guarantee you that. Because the church has people in it. And people don't always do the right thing. We're sinners. And we sometimes sin, and we sometimes seek our own way, and we're sometimes selfish, and we sometimes seek our own glory, and we sometimes do things that are not honorable uh, or loving, even. So even though we've seen their powerful preaching and their signs and wonders and their tremendous growth and their genuine Christian generosity and love and their humility and all these things we've seen, the, that picture is not a complete picture of the early church. Because we need to understand that we're just like them in that we're sinners saved by grace and we need to learn from the way that they handled their situations in life. The early church is not an exception to the rule. Our text tonight covers the first negative milestone in the life of the early church. Now I want you to know I remember from my childhood and my youth 
I remember two sermons. Two sermons I ever remember hearing. The first sermon that I remember hearing that is a little bit more obvious in my mind was when I went to a Bailey Smith crusade and the wheat and the tares he preached on. You may have even heard that sermon because he preached it all over the place. You know, uh, I remember that sermon. The second sermon I remember was a man came who was an evangelist from Britain, but I think he moved over to Illinois or Ohio or somewhere like that. Uh, but uh, Major Ian Thomas, you ever heard of him, Major Ian Thomas? Well, he came and preached a revival in our church one year, and he was a soft-spoken man that was very funny and would oftentimes go, <laughs> that was his punchline right there. He'd get to that and you would just laugh. But um, he preached a sermon on this passage tonight, and I still remember it today. And um, so last night I was sitting in the bed, and I found his sermon, and I listened to it again. And I pretty much remembered the whole thing. So it was one of those that you just remember. And he called it Sent, Went, and Put. Um, and, of course, that's not exactly how I would preach this passage, but I'm not Ian Thomas, see. Uh, but uh, anyway, it was a sermon that I remember. This, is, this had a powerful impact on me when I was about 16 years old, 15 years old is when he came. So let's, let's look at this text tonight and look at the first really recorded sin in the early church. Well, it is the first recorded sin in the early church. Uh, Acts chapter 5. But a man named Ananias, uh, Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained old soul, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your authority? Why is it that you have laid this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard. And the young men rose up, wrapped him up, and after carrying him out, they buried him. Now there was an interval of about three hours. Now I don't want y'all to ever complain about how long I preach. All right. They were having church, and there was an interval about three hours, and his wife came in not knowing what had happened. And Peter responded to her, tell me whether you paid this much for the land. And she said, yes, that much. Then Peter said to her, why is this that you've agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to the test? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out as well. And immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came over the whole church and over all who heard these things. Satan's purpose is to oppose the work of God. And Satan opposes the work of God in multiple ways. He could oppose the work of God through persecution, through government leaders. He could oppose the work of law, uh, the Lord through community leaders who seek to shut down the message of the church or the message of God's people. He could oppose you through someone at your work or a neighbor or whatever. Satan can oppose in many ways. But the way that is most effective for Satan to oppose is to get inside the church. Get inside the church. And he uses all kinds of methods to keep us from growing as a church and to keep us from growing the kingdom as a church. Distraction, that's his favorite tool. Keep us from focusing on what we should be focusing on. We should be focusing on the gospel. You know, you heard a church is splitting over the color of carpet, carpets and things like that. You know, that's silly. It's just plain silly. You, we are to be focused on the gospel and not all this other stuff. You know, yeah, we, we like the carpet, but I really don't care what color it is. I mean, honestly, I, you know, as long as people are being saved, that's what we're here for. And, and so distraction, there is dissension. Maybe this person will get upset with this person and they'll have this fuss in the church and it'll distract the whole church from doing what God has called them to do. Misdirection, sometimes Satan uses misdirection. He th makes us think this thing is more important than the thing that should be the most important and tries to get us to seek something that is not the will of God uh, and put that in place of will of God. 
And so for the greatest effort, that I think Satan performs, he attacks us from inside the church. And so that's why we have to be so diligent to to understand and discern and to know when it's Satan seeking to attack our church. And one of the greatest struggles for church leaders and and leaders in the church is when there's sin in the church. Because, you know, you're supposed to be able to trust each other. And you're supposed to not be able to, not have to worry about these things. But, But then you have to deal with these things. Whether it's the sin of the members or sin of a few members or sin of the pastor, these things must be dealt with. The most devastating problem for our churches today is sin in the camp. And we get that word, those words, sin in the camp, from an Old Testament story that is very similar similar to this. Uh, The story of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts is very similar to the story of Achan and his sin uh, in the book of Joshua. Um, You remember the story, but I'll just remind you since it's late in the evening and you're probably tired. Achan uh, took some things during the conquest of Jericho when there was a ban on taking things. There was a ban. You couldn't take plunder for yourself. And uh, Achan took some of those things and took them to his tent. And this sin of Achan caused Israel to fail in battle against the men of Ai. They they had a great defeat against the the men of Ai. The sin in the camp was a secret sin, but the Lord knew it. And the Lord brought it to the attention of the congregation. And what happened to Achan? Him and his entire household were destroyed. Both incidents interrupted the victorious, magnificent, glorious work of God. The the progress of the people of God because of the sin of the people of God. The drama in our passage tonight unfolds in four scenes. The first scene is the spiritual deception. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, you remember last week I talked about Barnabas, and he was the model of the generous church, churchgoer that sold a field and gave a piece of property, sold a piece of property and gave the proceeds to the church. He's the model. And this is not the model. (laughs) And so we want to contrast these two situations. I told you last week we were going to contrast them. He sold a piece of property and gave all the money to the church. They sold a piece of property and gave some of the money to the church and told the church that it was all the money. They were seeking to make, as it were, a double profit. What do you mean by that? Well... They were seeking to profit a little bit off the sale of their property and then to gain a little notoriety in their church bunch. Look at what we did. Look at how sacrificial we were. See, they wanted to earn a little money and they wanted to earn a little honor in the church. some spiritual prestige, if you will. I want you to know that holding back part of their earnings is not the sin. He sold a piece of property. They can give whatever they want to the church. They don't have to give it all. Their sin was lying about what they gave. Their sin was trying to come forward on the pretense that they gave it all. So holding back part of their earnings of this property is not the sin. We aren't commanded to give all our finances to the Lord. What if I started preaching that? Y'all probably find someplace else to go. You got to give it all. Unless you just tell them how to have a happy smile and then they give it all anyway. That's 
That's on TV, though. They only do that on TV, don't they? Their giving, like the New Testament giving, is a generosity issue. It's between you and God what you give. It's, it's an issue of, of, of generosity. And it's voluntary. But they sinned when they lied about the money that they made and they sought to pass their gift off as a complete sacrifice. This is a manifestation of a deeper sin. A deeper, more devastating sin. Their sin was lying, but their sin is really hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is the desire for the approval of others. Seeking to be something that you're not. Jesus had his strongest words for those who were hypocritical. The Pharisees. The religious leaders. You remember what he called them? White washed tombs who look good on the outside but are filled with rotten corpses he called them dishes that were filthy on the inside but clean on the outside they were not what they pretended to be George MacDonald writes half of the misery in the world comes from trying to look instead of trying to be what one is not we try to look like something we're not. And that brings us misery. God has called us to be, not to pretend to be. Hypocrisy, then, is the deliberate deception trying to make people think that we are more spiritual than we really are. Those are that's Warren Wiersbe's definition. None are so ugly in God's sight as those who flaunt spiritual beauty they do not possess. And remember that the sin against the church is a sin against Christ because he is the head of the church. Their offering was, affront to, was an affront to God and their execution is God's work to keep the church pure. Some have questioned whether these were true believers. Now, I don't see the point of the story if they're not. I don't see why it would cause there to be great fear over the church if they're not. I mean, don't y'all think true believers can have sin in their lives and try to be hypocritical? So I think these were clearly believers. And they were included in the congregation of those who believed. And they were involved with the Holy Spirit. They deceived the Holy Spirit. Why would God punish somebody that wasn't a spiritual being, that was dead in Christ? Why would God strike dead somebody that was supposed to know better, uh, that, that, that didn't have the Spirit? I mean, these people were supposed to know better because the Spirit was living in them. They were seeking to deceive the Spirit of God that was living in them. That's why they were struck dead, not because they broke some rule. So I think this is clear that these people were believers. And they had become personally involved with Satan. You know how Satan gets in the church? Well, he doesn't, certainly doesn't possess believers. That can't even be a thing. But certainly he's sitting there whispering in our ear, telling us to do this or that. Certainly God, God won't strike you dead if you eat the fruit. Certainly, certainly nobody will notice whether you give 60% of what you made off the land or 100%. Just tell them you gave it all. It'll be okay. And they'll, they'll think you're great. They don't know what, what, what the price was. This death is a divine chastening of two believers. And so those two were deceiving the church do you know you can deceive the church, but you cannot deceive God? It's important to note that their sin was motivated by pride. Pride is what leads to hypocrisy. And really, I, I believe firmly that pride is at the root, root of all sin. When you, when you think you should have something that you, you cannot, and you take it anyway, that's pride. 
Like adultery, that's pride. You think you should have something you can't? When you take someone's life, you think your life is more important than theirs. That's pride. I mean, really, the sin of Satan that got him kicked out of the garden is the thing that we struggle with the most. And it leads to all this other stuff. We think we should, we're in the place of God, so we can do whatever. It's pride. Anyway, that's my little soapbox. We can move on now. Spiritual uh, deception. Next, spiritual discernment. So Ananias, Ananias came in, and he tells him, you know, we're gonna, we sold this piece of property. Here's the money for the piece of property that we sold. That's all of it. And, of course, Peter... Peter's firing on all cylinders now. I mean, before he was denying Jesus, but now he's, he's batting a thousand, right? He's just been over there and he's preached in the temple and, you know, 3,000 people, and then 5,000 people got saved, people getting saved everywhere. He's firing on all cylinders. Peter's, Peter's up here. He comes in and tells him that he's got this stuff. And what does he say? But Peter said to Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back some of the price? Of the land. Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, Oh, you're lying. Why are you lying? The deceit of Ananias and Sapphira did not fool Peter because he was guided by the Holy Spirit to see through their hypocrisy. This is, this is really the you know, discernment that we talk about in Scripture. Barnabas was inspired by the Holy Spirit to give, but it was, uh, it was Satan that inspired Ananias and Sapphira. And it was completely unnecessary. Peter points out in the next verse, he says, While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your authority? He says, this was your piece of property. And after you sold it, that was your money. You're free to do with it whatever you want. We're not going to compel you to give it all. We're not going to force you to give it all. It's completely unnecessary. He was under no obligation to even sell it, is what Peter's saying. He's under no obligation to... Once he does sell it, give it all. Why is it this, that you've conceived this deed in your heart? The truth is plain and simple. Ananias was pressured by Satan to do this, to destroy the church and the work of God. You see, Satan had come to the realization that he, he had not won when Jesus came out of the grave. When that happened, he, he recognized the problem. Oh, I have not won. I need to stop whatever it is this, this new band of people is trying to do. And then we see swift dip discipline. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his laugh, and great, great fear came upon all who heard. And the young men rose, wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Seems strange to us, right? We got to call them coons or something. First we call 911. And then we got to get coons out here. Seems strange. I'll come take care of this. I mean, what? You see, in the early church days, the ushers weren't just there to seat guests and take up the offering. God moved quickly to remove a spiritual cancer from the body. And as soon as Ananias heard the words, he fell down dead. His death was judgment. It's a sobering truth that God sometimes takes the lives of sinning believers. But I want you to know, and I want you to hear this clearly, God sometimes takes the lives of sinning believers. Well, this could never happen today. Are you sure about that? Do you know for sure? I mean, people die all the time. And a lot of times they die without you knowing what sin's going on in their life. Does God still do this? Probably. Death is God's ultimate form of discipline in this life. And he wants to keep his church pure. 
Of course, now due to the hot climate in Palestine, they normally buried people the same day they died. That was customary for them to do. So this is not an unusual event for them to bury this person on the same day they died. But what may seem unusual here is that they didn't fetch his wife and that they buried him right then. They got him, wrapped him up, took him out, buried him, and it was done. And, and they're still having church. Three hours later, and they're still there having church. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, did they sing a hymn after they went out and buried him? I don't know what happened. You know what happened? You know, they're still they're having church. It's, it's an interesting thing. He, uh, Ian Thomas, in the sermon that I listened to last night, he said this. He said, you probably wouldn't have very large congregations if this was routine in our services today. He said, in fact, if, if this was common, you might rather be fishing. <laughs> three, hour, three hours later, Sapphire came in not knowing what had happened to her husband. Peter gives her a chance. Did you sell the land for this much? Oh, yes. Yes, we, we got our lives together beforehand, and that's what I'm supposed to say. And Peter says to her in verse 9 and 10, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Buried my husband? Bloop. You know, I mean, you, you can almost get this picture like, you know, she's finding out in the moment that she dies, that her husband's dead. <coughs> Judgment is equally swift. The same guys that buried her husband buried her. What was her cause of death? What was her husband's cause of death? Divine judgment. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, that some of them had died for partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 to 30, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. We need to take serious our commitment to the spiritual body of Christ. Sometimes things are hard. Sometimes difficult situations arise in the church, okay? And sometimes when these difficult things arise, we have to deal with them, and it's no fun. But let me tell you something. When God sends you a clear direction of what you need to do, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt what His will is in a church, what you do is not hard. It may be emotionally difficult. It may be something you don't want to do, but it's not hard when you're doing what God has told you to do. You just do it. Because you know He's going to take care of the results. And so when we have situations come up in our lives that are associated with the church and the Lord is leading us one way and we start listening to Satan on another, understand when you're doing God's way, it's not hard. It's actually the easy way, the best way. Now, the circumstances surrounding it may not always be easy, but it's always the best way because when you're in the center of God's will, you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. God has called us to follow his leading, period. So when we're seeking God's direction as a church, we need to seek God's direction and not Satan's. Satan's always speaking in somebody's ear, always telling somebody something, always trying to get us distracted so that we'll have a fuss or a fight or a disagreement. You know what? It doesn't matter what Satan thinks we should do as a church. You know that? It also doesn't matter what I think we should do. It doesn't matter what you think we should do. It only matters what God thinks we should do. 
Same is true with our own personal lives and our own personal finances. So Ananias and Sapphira, short-lived and foolish attempt to deceive the Holy Spirit and test God's patience ended with their death. Now I want you to know it's not all bad for them. Because I believe they were believers. So while they received divine discipline on this earth, when they, the next moment they were in heaven. And they probably won't think about doing that again. Now, now we need to look at what happened to the church. There's also sure direction we see in verse 11. And great fear came on the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Why did this happen? It's a lesson. This is the early church. Lots of things happened that would not happen in the same way again. What do you mean by that? Well, the day of Pentecost was a unique event. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the speaking in tongues, the fire, of heads, uh, fire on their heads. This was a unique event at the first coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see it repeated a couple of other times, which we'll get to eventually in the book of Acts. We see it repeated with the Samaritans and the Gentiles. And, you know, it's a unique event because you're adding... People that are outside the Jewish family into the church, you've got to have this unique event, the Samaritans. And then the Gentiles certainly needed a unique event of the filling of the Holy Spirit to be added to the church. So there's unity there. But we don't see the filling of the Holy Spirit with the tongues of flame when someone's saved now. But we also know that we don't receive Christ after we're saved. We receive uh, the Spirit after we're saved. We receive it when we're saved. Because Romans tells us if a person doesn't have the Spirit, they're not saved. So there's a difference now in the way this operates. So we don't see people falling over in the church for giving a poor offering. Not regularly. If it were to happen, it'd be a great illustration. I've often said that if I was going to ever have a heart attack, I'd love to do it while I'm preaching. Right after I said, you're not promised tomorrow. <laughs> Misty hates, hates it when I say that. but You're not promised tomorrow. Everybody gets saved. So this is a unique experience in the life of the church, not to say that it couldn't happen again, but to say it was a teaching moment in the life of the church to say we're going to remain pure with who we are in the church. And we're not going to try to pretend we can somehow deceive God. Because we can't do it. God was showing us the seriousness of sin in the church. And one of the benefits of God's discipline and even church discipline is that it deters others from sinning. I mean, why do we have capital punishment? Well, allegedly, it's supposed to be to deter others from doing that. But now it doesn't work that way because we wait 20 years to execute somebody. If you executed them, you know, just a week or so after the trial, you know, it would deter a lot more. That's what this is. It's a deterrent. The church has a clear direction now and they need to seek to remain without sin. So their deaths cause fear in the church. God wants his church pure. They're his bride. He wants us pure. And he will take drastic measures to secure that end. The Apostle, Paul, uh, Apostle Peter wrote in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, For it is time for judgment to begin on, at the household of God. And if it begins with us, then it will be the outcome for those who, uh, then what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So discipline begins with us. Judgment begins with us because God wants to keep us pure. We too are the church of God. We need to seek to not deceive God. We also need to understand that these, this judgment was put upon them, Ananias and Sapphira, not because they didn't give the whole amount, but because they lied about the amount they gave and they tried to fool God. They tried to fool the church. So I just want to ask you this question to think about tonight. Uh, have you sinned against God? Have you sinned against the church? Do you seek to be hypocritical in the church, to be something that you're not? God has called us to be who we are. Let us not fall into the danger and the trap of deceit to try to pretend we're something that we're not. Let us be God's people who seek to follow Him and are honest about it when we don't. And rest assured that God will punish even His children if they defile the church because it is his body 
and it is his bride. Let us remain pure. Father God, we thank you again for this lesson tonight. We thank you, Lord, for for just a, an eye opener, Lord, to see, see that we, we shouldn't be hypocritical. We shouldn't try to pass ourselves off as something as we're not. We shouldn't seek to, to, to pretend to be spiritual. We should actually seek to be spiritual and be honest about it when we're not. And Father, bless us as we hear this lesson tonight and help us to apply these truths to our hearts and our lives and to seek to follow you in all that we do. Father, we thank you for tonight and we thank you for this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen.